All right, there was one last slide in the uh, background before I got to the models that I forgot. Uh, just uh, the, addressing the question of uh, plasticity and role of the environment. This is an animal, uh, this is just something that I referred to earlier. If you inject the radioactive tracer into one eye in a control animal, um, if, if you inject it in one eye and leave the other eye intact, this is the pattern you get. So some areas are radioactively densely labeled and they alternate. This is the underlying ocular dominance map. This is a very large area. That's only a one millimeter, so this is a very large area of macaque uh, V1. Um, usually we'll, we're looking in an area like this um, or maybe like that. Um, this is a control animal and this is what happens when you uh, monocularly enucleate, i.e. chop off his eyeball and you leave the remaining eyeball. Um, in that case, I guess light must indicate uh, uptake of tracer because the remaining eye is where the tracer must have been. And so uh, the area of the cortex devoted to the remaining eye has greatly increased in this animal. And if you do it in lots of animals, you can systematically show it's the, the ones uh, with the nucleation end up like this, the control animals end up like this. Make sense? So this shows both the power and the limits of reorganization. You have reorganization on this scale such that individual stripes increase in width, but it hasn't taken over the entire cortex. There are plenty of areas of the cortex that still don't respond um, at this stage anyway. Eventually, maybe they would eventually uh, um, become responsive. So, does that make sense? Basically, and you can do the same thing. That's using, very, that's a very old technique. Um, using um, physical manipulations. You can also raise them in different environments and so on. This is harder to get right, but uh, more functionally relevant. And if you do that, you can show responses to different orientations. Again, the same pattern. You have the basic map structure doesn't change. The orientation that's overrepresented in your world becomes overrepresented in your maps. If you do this in young animals, you see good results like this. If you do it in older animals, it becomes less and less visible, the results of changing the environment in this way. Okay, well, that's background. Uh, models. Uh, what do you need to do to do a map scale model? Well, you start with a box and arrow diagram like any model. And what are your boxes and arrows in this case? Um, they're not neurons, uh, although there are neurons in there. Um, you, need, you start with uh, interconnecting multiple maps usually. Because if you're just, just studied V1 by itself, it's hard to do much with it because you need inputs and outputs. And luckily, the visual system has a relatively straightforward pathway from input to output. If, it, if we were to do the same type of architecture for the auditory system, there'd be 20 different stages between the ears and A1. This is why modeling the auditory system is a mess. Um, but in V1, there's just photoreceptors, then some processing that we don't care about uh, because we've, we're trying to capture a phenomenological model of the retinal ganglion cells, and then some processing in the LGN. So there's one synapse. So from here, they go to LGN, and that's one synapse. And from the LGN, you go to V1. In V1, um, I've, I've depicted V1 as one box here. By one box, I mean one topographically arranged set of cells with homogeneous properties in some sense. They don't all prefer the same orientation, but they all prefer some orientation, let's say. Um, real V1 will have many such sets of cells. There are a bunch of excitatory cells that are of a particular type, a bunch of inhibitory cells of a particular type. Over an area, you'll have multiple cell classes at a particular lamina, lamina A. Um, so at one laminum, laminum? Lamina. I'm not Latin. Um, uh, one lamina, multiple laminae. Got it. Uh, anyway, at one lamina, uh, you'll find a certain set of cell classes, but if you look at a different lamina, you'll find other cell classes. Um, in particular, the, um, the plots that I showed of uh, these, these connections, these neurons that have very long range connections, those tend to be in uh, layer two, three, which is in many areas, they're separate layers, twos and three, but in the visual cortex, two and three are almost indistinguishable. So there's, it's just one layer, it's called layer two, three. Um, and neurons in that layer are the ones that have these very long range patchy connections. If you tried to did the same injection and you were targeting neurons in layer four, the, one, the layer that gets direct thalamic input, you would see much shorter connectivity and it'd be hard to see any patches because it'd be local. 
So the, the layer matters, the cell type matters. Um, in the simplest version of, of such a model, we ignore all of that and we put it into just V1. And I will almost only talk about the simplest version of the model because there's no way I could get, we, we have an hour right now. There's no way we can do much. And uh, in your tutorial today, you'll, again, you'll look at the simplest version. One set of cells in V1, not even distinguishing between excitatory and inhibitory cells, not distinguishing between layers, not distinguishing between anything else, collapsing it all. And why would that be at all relevant to do? Because we only get one set of data from our optical imaging experiment. We only get the surface of the cortex and its organization. That's all we have. So you don't have a whole lot to go on if that's all you have. You need to bring in lots of different sources of evidence if you want to distinguish between laminae and cell types and such. And you can do that and we do that in other studies, but the first pass, if you just want to say, okay, I've got a map model, is it working at all correctly? You can do that with only a single map because you only have, your fundamental data is only a single sheet of uh, orientation preference, say. So, um, and how many neurons are in this map? Well, you need to, uh, we really just start out not talking about neurons. You start to, there will be neurons, we will get to neurons, from neurons to maps, from networks to maps. But you start out with a map, you say, okay, I need to simulate um, a certain number of square millimeters because those will be the ones that, that will correspond to something real in the world. If you look at only the tiny little, tiniest little bit um, and look at the neural representation, yeah, you could see that a, a very small patch of V1 might correspond to it. But that won't be behaviorally relevant. If you want something that could actually, you could train the animal to respond to reliably, you're going to want some um, several millimeters squared of area. And so you start with that area and then you basically throw as many neurons into that box as you can as, as you uh, have time for and as, as much memory as you've got on your system. And you hope that by doing so, because everything is smoothly organized, hopefully it'll still work. <laughs> That's, uh, and the, the only justification for it is that it does work. Otherwise, it's a completely ridiculous thing to do. But it works, so it's good. Um, so uh, why would you do this? Well, um, I want to understand why these, where these maps come from. We talked about this in general, what you might want to, uh, earlier I had a slide about research questions having to do with maps. Those are for experimental people, computational people, whatever. What are the experimental questions you can address specifically using computation? And that's a much smaller subset. What are the things you can actually run on your computer and decide? Well, you can look at computation. That, computers are really good for that. Um, you can look at development. That's really hard to do in the, in the lab. It's very hard to collect data from the same animal over time. It's, it's almost never done. That's, it's it's uh, at the map level. As I said, it's been done it's been definitely been done once. I can't think, uh, there are these other studies that'll, like this, that are occasional, but these are just little single data points, little bits. They don't show the process, they don't show what's really going on. It's very hard to get data, uh, but it's very easy to just uh, run things on a computer and you can try to see at least, do you have a reasonable starting point and reasonable final results? Well, that's a start, it's more than we know from, from a lot of things. So you can do a lot of things on a computer that are actually a lot more difficult in the lab. And if you can do some things that link development and adult function, then you can start to do what I want to do, which is explain why the cortex is as it is. Why should it be like this? If you want to address why, I think you have to get at development. How did it come to be that it, be, that it was like this? How, why didn't it become something else? Uh, and that's, that's why I think development is extremely important. Um, once you're done, you can use these models and you can actually run simulated psychophysical experiments. A psychophysical experiment is you can do it a human, you just present something and you have the human press a button. That's fundamentally, that's a psychophysical experiment. They, you present some pattern and they can either distinguish it, you present a line like this and a line like that. Can they tell you which one is tilted more than the right? Eventually, they can't. You can run lots of exp psychophysical experiments on that and you can uncover various illusions and after effects that way. You can run those same things on your models subject to certain assumptions about how the data is read out. And uh, you can basically connect development to adult function, to adult misfunction, uh, which is used often more illuminating. And then basically whenever you have an experiment that's done at the map level, and, and in my opinion many experiments should be done at the map level, but only certain ones are, only certain things are practical to do at the map level. Um, uh, when you have that data, you can try to replicate it on, the, on, the, um, on a computer and you can try to um, predict the response to things that haven't been done yet. You can try to understand what might be explaining what has been done. 
What you can't do is prove anything about the actual physical system, right? Surely, hopefully, nobody's going to try to do that with your computers. You can't do it. You can't prove anything about the system. You can only prove things about what you've put into your, into your model, um, and these are all, uh, but you can address a lot of questions that way, um, and you can show that it's possible to do it the way that you're doing on the computer. That's where you can show. You can show that an existence proof, and you can make predictions. You can test and test those, but you can't demonstrate anything about the underlying system. To do that, you have to mess with the underlying system. So. Okay, so as I, as I mentioned, if you wanted to do a map model, and I think a lot, from what I saw of what you guys were looking at, a lot of you aren't thinking at the map level, but some of the questions you're addressing, you're looking at a very small patch of things, but you're thinking in terms of how that relates to the overall organism. Now, if you wanted to, uh, to model that just in, few, in terms of a few connected neurons, you have somebody who measures data about those neurons and you try to replicate those in your model, that's fine. That's modeling at one level, but what if you wanted to embed that in a larger map model? That's what I'm getting at in this, in this talk. You may or may not ever want to do that, but if you do, um, you would start with uh, typically a cortical area, although lots of subcortical areas have, have maps too, many of them. Not, maybe not most of them, but certainly many of them do in terms of a systematic organization of some sort. Um, but if you picked some area, um, you wouldn't start with, I've got a channel, now I, bat it, now I build it up and I get a patch of membrane, and then I build that up and I get a whole neuron, and then I add in, maybe add another neuron, and another, another neuron, is that going to work? Are you going to get to a map? Not in your lifetime, you're never going to get to, you're not going to have the data to constrain all of those steps. You've got to do the opposite, you've got to start at the map level, and maybe um, hopefully fill in a little bit that you understand really well and try to link that into this overall map level. Maybe have a coarse overall model and a really fine one, you try to make a link between your really fine one and the coarse one. That's, that's perfectly feasible and that's in the spirit of this uh, summer school. Um, so basically you add overall detail and maybe sometimes you add very focused little bits of extreme detail. So you add whatever details you need to study some particular phenomenon and that depends on whatever data, type of data you have. And then how much detail you, you add is limited by how big your computers are, how long you can wait for them, how smart you are. This is almost always the fundamental thing. Basically, how complicated a system can you ever figure out and ever make it work and ever know what it's doing? That fundamentally is mainly the limitation. And that's tied into how much data you have. Because if you have a ton of data that constrains everything, you don't necessarily have to understand as much. You can say, oh, I don't know the answer, I just put, put it right in. But that's often completely impossible because the data is, is almost never that clear and clean and obvious and straightforward. You still have to understand it. You still have to really know what's going on and that gets you to this one. So often you're very, very constrained on the amount of detail, even no matter how fast your computer is, no, no matter how big it is. So you, you put that in, then you validate your model on whatever data you have. In my opinion, Everything I do is tries to bring in as much, as many different sources of data, completely different data from different labs of different types, psychophysical data on humans, bring it in there, genetic manipulations on mice, bring it in there. I try to bring everything in there under the assumption that the basic architecture of the cortex is very similar and that fundamentally it's doing similar computations and if that's true, I can make it all work. Obviously, that's a whole lot of assumptions, but I think that that's, that's my own, uh, uh, approach. Other people will be much more narrow about the sort of data they care about. Uh, anyway, you validate that model on whatever you've got and then try to make predictions and uh, repeat as necessary. Okay, just go do that. No, no, you need more, you need more than that. Um, you need to know, have, you have some idea of what, a, what it means to model a map. Okay, so let's say you've picked your area and you've got your experimental data ready and you know how much detail about you can handle. Um, so what do you do? First thing you do is a grid usually, a mesh or a array, whatever you want to think about it. You've got a continue, you have a, a nearly infinite number of neurons and you just sample it according to some regular arrangement, either a Cartesian grid or a hex grid. Usually if you have a dense enough grid it doesn't really matter in most cases, but uh, the typical way is a Cartesian grid because computers, that works nicely on computers. And then what's, what's your grid element? Um, well, it's either, uh, if you have what's called a mean field model, your grid element is not a neuron. Uh, 
your grid element is a representation of the average properties of that region. Now that hurts people's heads, unless you're a mathematician, mathematicians love these models. Other people just say, okay, I know this is wrong, but what I have at a grid, that's a neuron. Now sure the real system has 10 billion neurons and I've got 112, but I'm gonna make it work. Each one of those is a neuron and I'm gonna fudge it somehow. And that's a much more typical way to do it. Um, and so what do you make at each little point if you're not doing a mean field model? Well, you make a, you do a neuron. So what, what kind of neuron do you do? Uh, the typical thing you do is a point neuron, which is ridiculous compared to some of the stuff you've done earlier in the course. The entire neuron is just a single point in space. So this whole patch of neurons that has maybe 10,000 neurons in it, you've replaced it by one neuron with no spatial extent. Clearly insane thing to do, unless it works. Um, and moreover, that point neuron doesn't even have spikes usually in these types of models. It has only a firing rate. It's got one number associated with it that is its instantaneous state. It is either firing at zero of at zero or at 100% or somewhere in the middle. That's all it does. That's the, that's the typical standard thing to do in, a model, in this type of model. Now, as I said, you can always take one little bit and replace it with anything arbitrarily much more complicated. Fine, great, um, but, but, if you, but if you want to do that at the map level, it's very hard to do anything but, but something like this. Um, the second most common is integrate and fire neurons. Um, those are also typically point neurons, but they are, um, they spike. So I presume these have come up already? Okay. Um, there are plenty of map models that use integrate and fire neurons. There are a few map models that have multiple, that are not point neurons, that have multiple compartments within each, in, within each one. The ones that do tend to be almost as ridiculous as point neurons, so I don't know why there's any point. They'll have a soma and then an axon and maybe three uh, dendrites uh, or some smaller processes somewhere. Um, and there are so many reasons for that. One would be that, let's say you've got some beautiful compartmental model with thousands of compartments. You've got it here. Okay, now you need a million more of these. Do you have them? No, you might have one from one animal. You might have 10 from one animal. But you don't have enough to build a map from one animal ever. And so you've got some other ones. Oh, you can cram them together. This is called the Blue Brain Project, which is to measure a whole bunch of, uh, of mice, um, take the similar spot in each one, and measure a lot of neurons, and then cram them all together. Even though, why is a neuron shaped like that? It's because there's a neuron here, a neuron here, a neuron here, a neuron here. Their shape is because of what they're connecting to. So when you cram them together, they just sort of uh, morph them. They, got, they have complicated rules for morphing and bending them into the right shape. It's, it's largely made up. If you're gonna make up stuff, just, just don't even simulate it. Just say, oh, I made it up, <laughs> and it didn't matter. Just, just put the sim basically, if you don't have enough data, there's no point in running your model. So these models are driven by the fact that you need to simulate a ton of neurons and you don't have the data, you just don't. So you need to do a stupid model because you don't have any data to drive a good model. And as I said, the only justification for that is that it, that it works. If it didn't work, be, everyone would just laugh at you. Well, people still will laugh at you. But they'll laugh at you while your results actually work and they actually explain things, if that's true. And it's only gonna be true for animals that have nice smooth orientation maps where you can represent a thousand neurons by one and it still works. That's only a fact of them having these smooth organized maps. Otherwise it wouldn't, there'd be no point. So anyway, it does work to do this, for, depending on your question. It could work to do this, but nobody's ever successfully built a model like that. People are trying, people are spending amazing amounts of money. There are at least five different European projects involved, each involving six different partners and they're all putting all their money into building such a massive model and maybe it'll work. Meanwhile, these models work today. Um, Synapses, oh, you could have a whole supercomputer devoted to a synapse if you wanted to. But here, synapses are one number, the strength, the weight. This is a connectionist type approach, uh, popular in the 1980s and even in the 50s. Um, two neurons connect, there's a number that's the strength, but that's it. Um, you, can, you can even do this, not even on a computer, you can do this in your, in your very fancy mathematical brain. You can write down equations and uh, represent everything without even simulating in terms of a discrete grid, uh, but that's, that's it's, it requires the occasional genius. Um, I don't even know how their brains work. So uh, if you want to see, there are, oh, I have, uh, there are much later reviews than this. I, this is 
taken from an old slide. So there, these are good reviews of map models, but they're more recent ones as well. Um, anyway, this, so typically, I'm, uh, this is, so what we'll focus on is that, of course, uh, the typical and simple case. Um, uh, what are examples of such models? And I'm only focusing really on developmental models because, um, well, because the other types of models don't matter, in my opinion, but that's probably a little, a little too, um, too glib. It's just that basically what is it you want to explain? And if you try to explain why a patch of cortex becomes this Thursday, 11.30, it always happens. Then fires engulf us. Never. All right, so um, basically the, uh, the developmental models will try to explain why a patch of cortex becomes a visual cortex, becomes an orientation map, and I think those are the ones that are, uh, that are interesting at the map level because they're un you can't really address those questions except at the map level. So of, the, of those, there's, how many people have heard of a self-organizing map? Ah, oh, it's interesting because uh, over time, these, these models used to be extremely popular for data analysis and, and visualization. They were originally inspired by the brain, but they kind of went off and, uh, and, and they're becoming less popular over the years so that um, it's interesting to see almost nobody uh, currently familiar with them. That's, that's actually good. Um, uh, there are basically the type of model I'll focus on is a very simple um, uh, uh, idea of just heavy and learning. When you have two c connections, uh, what sets the strength of that? It'll be the um, overtime, is this active and this active at the same time? Then it'll be a strong strength, and if not, not a weak strength. So uh, I'll focus exclusively on models like that. There are also models that, that try to go from information theory or from very high level principles to say, this is what a neuron should be doing. It should be organizing, um, uh, if you're in the visual system, it should be representing the visual world in this way, and we can derive that mathematically and look. If we do that, we see things that look like the brain. So there'll be, those are models of this type. Um, and there are, a lot, there are tons of models, and the, the thing about high level, as you go away from the, high, from the low level, there becomes less agreement between people, because there are many possible high level interpretations of the same underlying phenomena. At the low level, everyone agrees, oh, Hodgkin Huxley explains very well the very small uh, things, but what about what it all means? What it all comes together? This is all just different churches, <laughs> different religions. No one agrees on that stuff. And uh, the same here. If you try to, people don't agree at the map level um, uh, on, on a lot of, on much. They agree, they don't agree whether it's fundamentally activity driven. I will all present activity driven. There are people who argue that it's all uh, fundamentally just the way it's wired, hardwired. Um, they don't agree on what drives it, whether it's external world or not. They don't agree on whether there's an objective to it or whether it just happens, uh, whether it's tied to vision, whether it's not. All the fundamental basic questions basically there's not agreement on. Um, and some of them, particularly this one say, uh, is very well motivated from the machine learning community it's very hard to make a relationship between that and actually what happens in the brain because it relies on things like negative activations and let's, if you square a negative activation, what do you mean if you square a negative activation? What are you even talking about? And then some of the people other will try to come up with a way that that makes sense. But they're starting from information theory, they're starting from machine learning and starting from things that really make sense mathematically and trying to map those onto the brain, whereas things like BCM and Hebbian and, and CBL are starting with the brain and trying to make, those sense, make, make that make sense mathematically. Does that make any sense? Anyway, uh, I'll give a sample model, which is um, the most important model in the world because it's the model I use. So clearly it must be. Uh, it's also the one I can be very, most authoritative about because I know exactly how it works and everything it does. Uh, that does not make it the most important model. It just, it's a model. Um, so um, this particular model, um, is of the structure, the overall structure. I'll focus only on these, this part here from photoreceptors to uh, here the retinal ganglion cells in the LGN have been collapsed into one layer because in an anesthetized animal it's hard to show a difference between the ganglion cells and the thalamus cells in their responses. In the unanesthetized animal, big differences. But in the anesthetized animal, which is basically what we call an open loop configuration, stuff goes here, goes here, goes here, and then that's it. It doesn't go up and then go in these reverberating loops with complicated dynamics, hopefully. 
Uh, you, it's trying to minimize that and depending on the anesthesia chosen. So uh, under those conditions, you can just model, basically all we're doing is we're saying we have some images and we have a transformation of the images going to V1, which is a very simple model of one cells and off cells. This is actually very well agreed on the difference of Gaussians model. Um, very, it captures a very good percentage of what the, the actual cells do at, at the LGN level. And then we try to explain what happens in V1. So basically all of this is fixed, everything coming in. If you're a neuron in LGN, you will always have the same difference of Gaussian receptive field. You'll always respond to the same, the same way. And, and your response is actually normalized by your neighbors. Uh, so there's connectivity at the LGN that I won't, need, won't talk about. But basically your response is then given to V1. If you're a neuron in V1, you get input from a certain part of the LGN. If you're a neuron over here in V1, you get input from here in the LGN. These tiny little things here, that's an activity bubble. That's about one millimeter here. So this is a huge model of V1 here. This is a imaginary model of V1 as if it were all phobia, as if it were all central vision. This makes things so much nicer just to not have the difference between things in the middle and things in the out, outside. It's not realistic, but it's, it actually, you can look at it and immediately you can see the pattern of activity. You can see how that relates to here. If we put it in a complicated mapping that's true, you wouldn't see anything. So this is a, an idealized one that's much easier to learn from and understand. So basically, we have an image. You have, as you can see, this is an edge enhanced version of the image where there's a strong edge. You get a strong response. This is a white to black edge. So you see on cells responding as you come up to the edge and off cells responding as you go out from the edge. So off cells respond here, on cells respond there. Um, if you take this and add it to that, you'll mostly get the same as the original image, except that any constant areas will have no response. No neuron is responding out here, or only tiny little bits, just from the noise. And no neuron is responding over here, because those are both constant areas. So essentially this is called edge enhancement. It's also called edge detection, but that's a misnomer because there's, the detection is either true or false. This is just enhanced. Edges become strong in this image and non-edges, constant areas become weak. Yes? Yeah, um, the example you give um, for us is the image, the static image. Yes. Um, so the position, we can to show the position is uh, the, the bottom, the left. And uh, if the human look at the real, the natural scene, how do you know the essential point? I mean, the fixation the, point? Yeah, the fixation point is always changing, right? This is at any instant. So image, we can say the point is, uh, this is whatever's on the photoreceptors. So if you move where your eyes are, you'll get a different pattern on the photoreceptors. This is whatever is there. It doesn't matter where you're looking, there will be something there. This is what, in this particular case, the monkey or the person is assumed to be looking right there. But had the monkey been looking anywhere else, you'd have a different image here because a different set of photons would have reached the back of the eye. So what do you say is every time we can see something, we have a central point. Is that right? Because you need to get, uh, the There's a central point whether you're seeing anything or not. And that's just a function of the optics of your eye. There will be a point um, that maps to the center of your visual field. It's in, it's in your eye. I can't point to it. And at that point, the receptors will be more dense. It'll be there. And when, what we're doing during daily life is we're moving that point around all the time yeah. to, to the areas where it'll be most informative. But at, at any instant, which is what this represents, this is one instant. At that instant, there's just an image. There's not some complicated scan path or anything. There's just an image, that's it. Over time, the contents of this will be dizzying to watch mm -hmm. for a human being or a macaque in free viewing. In free viewing, you're going, You, you go all over the place. In none of these experiments are the animals doing free viewing. They get rid of that right away. Animals are trained to fixate or more typically, they paralyze the eye muscles. They can't do anything but just go. And they're asleep anyway. So they're just sitting there, they're acting like a video camera uh, as much as possible. <laughs> so, uh, and that's all we're trying to explain by the way. We're not trying to explain behavior of animals in natural vision tasks 
where they're interacting with the world, moving things around, enjoy, avoiding shadows, doing things, performing some tasks. Oh my God, that's so hard to explain. I don't even want to get, get into that. Um, these are very rare experiments to do. That's called awake behaving experiments. They happen, they're very unusual. No one does awake behaving optical imaging experiments. At the, if you do them in monkeys, you can't actually get something like an orientation map because of the, the jitter and the um, vibration. You, can't get, you can do optical imaging in monkey, awake behaving monkeys, but if you do that, it's basically like taking a Gaussian kernel and blurring the whole cortex massively because you can't get, because, every, because the eyes are jittering, the brain is jittering, you can't see, and it's jittering on a scale that's greater than one millimeter for your measurements. And the scatter, and the photonic scatter is just such that you can't make out individual orientation columns. So unfortunately, anything we know that's about orientation columns or ocular dominance columns or any of the other little patches uh, in the functional maps, anything we know about that is not measurable at, using current techniques right now, today, is not measurable in um, awake behaving animals. You can measure retinotopy in awake behaving animals because the visual cortex is huge. And so there are many millimeters between this area of the visual field and this area of the visual field. Many millimeters in a human, you can measure, you can do retinotopic maps for awake behaving humans. Uh, but any other map, anything else I showed, direction, orientation, color, anything else is not measurable right now using current techniques. And so everything I'm going to talk about at all or even attempt to model is about um, anesthetized animals blindly being, uh, not blindly, um, being force fed images uh, while they're just sitting there doing nothing. Is that clear enough? Yeah, but can you explain why the people who can still see the object, <laughs> they're not the Oh, well, people don't, people don't have to worry about optical imaging because the mapping between the eye and the brain doesn't change when they move their head. <laughs> but the mapping, um, so the world is changing, but at least all of the internal circuitry is staying the same. Whereas if you're an experimentalist trying to measure it, anytime any movement happens anywhere, you've got whatever happened in the world and whatever happened in your head to deal with. And so even for awake behaving, they try to lock the cortex down, but you're you're breathing and you, you do stuff and, and it changes. When you're anesthetized, you can, you can you set them so they have a very regular breathing. You actually control the level of anesthesia so that their breathing is very regular and you synchronize to the pulse so that you make sure you only measure in between heartbeats because it, it, it's a, technically it's a mess. So humans don't have to worry about any of that. They don't care because the connection is already there. It is an important question how we can still make sense of our external world even though our eyes are darting around and so on. But that's a question I won't address today and no one will address anytime soon so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> it's an important question but it's not one that we are currently equipped to answer. We have so many more fundamental questions just about how anything ever happens. And that's what we ought to be working on. Okay? Okay. So. Um, and then uh, it says space selective area. You can, you can make a cheat and just say from V1, I want to get straight to vision. I want to stay straight to de detecting faces or something. You can do that. Uh, that's kind of a cheat here. Here I'm talking about other work where we're looking at influence of brainstem. Brainstem also, uh, the pons actually sends information to the thalamus that goes to V1. These are, I don't know why they're still on the slide. Um, those are from different studies, different time. So basically, we have a fixed mapping of everything feeding into V1, and the goal of these models is V1 is just an empty soup, uh, it's just a big soup of neurons and connections, and by the time it's done, it's supposed to look like an orientation map or whatever else you might see out of visual system. You're trying to explain how a bunch of neurons and a bunch of connections could become a map, could be some, something that does something important and useful or at least pretty. Okay. so. Um, this particular model, all it does is have heavy in learning for the connection from here to here, from here to here, from all of these connections. So that's maybe a, a few dozen connections here, a few dozen connections here, all up to this, to any V1 neuron. It's got a few dozen connections to its local neighbors and a few thousand, um, well, hundreds of connections anyway to its more distant neighbors. And all of these connections are initially random. And all you're trying to do is show how this initial so the initial structure where you make sure you feed stuff into this cortex and you have as simple a model of V1 as you can. It's completely simple and brain dead. As I said, if it didn't work, no one would be surprised that it didn't work. But it does work 
And if you feed in color, natural moving images, you get maps for orientation. Well, if you have two eyes, you get maps for ocular dominance. You get maps for direction. You get maps for uh, color. You get all sorts of uh, things out of it. You get receptive fields. That was what I showed you. The, uh, the neurons in LGN prefer center surround. The neurons in V1 initially don't prefer anything. They just, they, um, they will just respond based on the position. They just have a set of random connections. So it doesn't matter what's in there, it's going to respond. When it's done, it develops an oriented receptive field, stronger in one eye than another, stronger for one color than another, and so on. So that's, that's the goal of this type of model. And if we want to look at something like visual after effects or visual illusions, what we do is take this activity pattern on V1. What this is showing here is a, a rendering of what you could measure in the cortex if you had perfect optical imaging. Normally, optical imaging, you measure, you just get noise. You have to, me you have to measure it 10,000 times and average the same input, different responses, and then, ah, then you can start to see responses. Here, you dispense with that and it just always works. Here, this is showing that these neurons are not responding. There are pa there's patchy response every time there is an edge in the image, and we'll show that those patches are actually orientation selective, um, and so on. Oh, and I was talking about after effects. But this is just a pattern of activity. How do you get from there to an after effect? An after effect or an illusion would be if you show this pattern, the subject reports, oh, that's vertical. You show this, it's not vertical. But after, while they're having an after effect or an illusion, you show this and they say, oh, yes, that's vertical. So it's a difference in the reported pattern. We can do that by measuring the orientation preference of all your neurons that are responding and then averaging those. So let's say that you had a bunch of neurons that normally prefer vertical and they're all active. You can say with high confidence that there's a vertical line. But if in some sort of illusion, they will falsely be activated. So that basically you can make a connection from the pattern of activity at V1 to a behavioral result. Does that make any sense? Okay. But all I'm saying is that we don't know what happens in V1 in the rest of the brain. But we can make an assumption or a claim that basically if a neuron is a horizontal neuron here, that the rest of the brain is going to be told there's a horizontal line at that location. That's what it means for a horizontal selective neuron to be one to respond. And so if it's falsely claiming there's a horizontal line, that will be an illusion. That's when you'll have an illusion. So. Okay. Um, all right. So um, I didn't include the equations here, and that's good because I see I won't have any time anyway. Um, so I'll include equations when we get to our modeling tutorial, because you actually have a model in front of you and I'll put up the equations. But for now, try to understand it in, uh, in rough terms. Basically, you've got a set of numbers here, a little matrix of numbers here, matrix of numbers here, your neighboring activities is a matrix of numbers, and you're going to compute your own activity. That's what you need to do if you want to figure out um, the, uh, your activity. And if you want, and there's a weight associated with each pixel to V1, there's a weight and you want to figure out the values of those weights. That's what the equations will tell you, your activity and your weight values. So we'll get to the actual equations at the tutorial. But meanwhile, there are equations that govern the behavior of this, or it wouldn't be a model, it would just be magic. So there are equations, and when you run those equations, and you feed in inputs like this, this is meant to re represent retinal waves, so this is not inputs in the, from the world, this is just spontaneous activity that happens before birth. And all this is trying to do is have some patch that's more active than the surround. And then you feed it natural images. In this case, they're monochrome. They're tiny little patches of images. We're only going to be looking at a tiny little area of V1. That's all you can afford to do in your tutorial because you don't have a supercomputer. Um, this, these results were supercomputer results. Um, so we have a tiny patch of an image. And we feed a bunch of these. And then we feed a bunch of images. And that's it. We just let everything else work. Um, the values are initially, all the weights are initially random, but governed by these equations and by the patterns you fin feed in, the, the weights will change and we'll get results of some sort. Okay, you get results. What this is, is a, this is a uh, uh, pattern, this is a um, map model called LISOM, the one that, from the previous um, slide. It's actually, this projector is so blurred that you can't see the pixels. But there are pixels here, each one of these little, there's, there might be somewhere, oh, here maybe you can see a pixel. Um, anyway, there, this, is a fine, this is 142 pixels by 142 pixels. 
So each pixel represents one neuron, and that's the color of the, the orientation preference of that neuron measured by presenting a bunch of sine gratings. A sine grating is a pattern that's bright, dark, bright, dark, and so a sine grating at one orientation present lots of them, and we measure the, the preferred response that's labeled here, and you do the same thing for the monkey. That's, that's the experimental data. And basically what's happening here is that neurons become similar to the neighbors. They do that because they are connected to their neighbors, and the connections uh, will make them become more similar. Um, they become different from their neighbors, from their more distant neighbors. That's because they have basically these connections here are excitatory, these are inhibitory, so they become more similar to their nearby neighbors and they become more different from their more distant neighbors and they're not even connected very, well actually the connections in this one, the model simulates connections over this scale. The real connections are over that scale, but that takes a whole lot of memory and we don't have it. So uh, in any case, you don't need to simulate those very long connections just to get maps. So we have, and each one of these is a neuron that has some orientation preference uh, according to this, to this uh, color key. And if you, you can run, and like, you can just say, oh, those look similar, but you can also run a lot of different analyses. There are all sorts of analyses people have suggested for this. You can fi find what are called pinwheel centers, these little spots where you get a rainbow of color around it, um, like right here and right here. Um, you can measure the density of those across relative to the size of the blobs. There are a lot of things you can do. And, and, uh, some models do well on that. This one does very well. Some models do not. So, um, just to give you an idea how it all, what this pattern might represent, I'll go back to this model here. We were pre just now we were looking at a tiny patch. Now I'm going to go back up to this whole patch, this massive model here, because that's big enough to feed a real image. You can actually see real things going on. So let's do that. Now this is not a real model because there is no, this would require a huge brain, because this would be as if your fovea representation was true across your whole visual field. You, so your fovea represented, took this much, you'd need a brain that big to do this. But at least this, and this gets back to your point about how we understand an image by, even though we're doing little bits at a time, we have this massive image and we get little bits of high resolution and somehow we make sense of it. Here, the network is getting it all at once, so you can make sense of it. So the, this represents some tiny little patch here, right? Okay, so we've replicated the phobia across the whole visual field, and now we can feed in, uh, so this has 500,000 neurons in it. The real corresponding map would have who knows how many more neurons than this, uh, but this is 500,000, uh, 100 million connections. Um, and here's an image. This is a nice, easy to understand image. That's why this image is here, because you can immediately see there's an orientation like this, there's an orientation like that, there's an orientation like that, there are orientations like this here, and so on. So it's a very clear and easily understood image. Here's what happens after the LGN. This is combining the on and the off, where white ones are on cell activity, white pixels are on cells active, black pixels are off cells active, gray cells mean that neither was active. In no case will they both be active. That's just not, the way they're defined, that's never going to happen. They're, they're anti-correlated. Um, so, okay, so this is the same image. Essentially, it's become edge enhanced. No response out here to the Scottish sky. It's just plain gray. Um, relatively little response uh, to this gray wall. Although there's some stuff going on that's been enhanced. Very strong response to the strong contours. Okay. Now, if you feed that to V1, this is what you get. Now, this takes a lot of thought. And so for some people, this might be obvious, but for others, for normal people, this takes thought to understand. Here, you've got everywhere is patchy. You used to have continuous responses so that this neuron's responding, that neuron's responding. Each pixel is a neuron, right? Each one of these little dots here, that's one neuron in the LGN. Um, each one of these little dots is one neuron in the V1. So, um, uh, and if you look along a contour, so on the first pass, that's a vertical line. That's clearly a vertical line, right? So which neurons are activated? Uh, here's the map. Here's all the neurons colored by their orientation preference. Here's the ones that were activated. Well, 
along here, the ones that were activated are the ones that are, have orientation preference near vertical, right? What are all these patches that are not activated? Well, those, I don't know if you can, I guess if I hold my hand there. Um, let's see, that's, this will, so, uh, the, this map doesn't show retinotopic preference. So there will be some neurons in this area that have, this, have the right orientation preference, but they don't have this retinotopic preference. They might prefer the opposite. Like right here, let's say, this is black, white. Um, now right under my finger, there's some neurons that you would think of to responding, but those, re those neurons probably respond to white, black. And so the, um, they aren't going to be responding right there. These neurons right here, they're red. They shouldn't be responding because there isn't a horizontal line at that point. So the patchiness is all neurons that are present and vi viable. They could have responded but are not responding. Moreover, this does not indicate false, this is not an illusion of a broken line. What does this neuron prefer? It prefers a pattern like that. What does this neuron prefer? A pattern like that. If you sum all of their receptive fields up, you'll show that they, it prefers a whole unbroken vertical line. And the same everywhere. These are horizontal lines, so they're gonna be responding horizontal. Whatever orientation that is, is gonna be orangey, yellow, orange, yellow, green, so whatever that is, uh, and so on. Yes? This is the, this is a plot of the cortical surface, and this is about one millimeter between blobs. As I said, all maps are on the scale of about a millimeter, so this is about a millimeter, and so that means that this is maybe 300 micrometers in cortical terms. In retinal terms, in the real animal, it depends very much where you are. If you're in the fovea, or you're in retinal terms, your receptor field will be very small. If you're over here, in, in periphery, it'll be very huge. So your mapping from the world to your cortex is variable, but your, map, your pattern in the cortex is always about the same. It's always about a millimeter. So always, you'll have blobs on this scale, the 300 micrometer or so blobs, regardless of whether you're, this model doesn't have fovea or periphery, but if it did, it would still look like this. It would just be all weird, crazy angles because of the crazy angled mapping. But the actual blob size would be similar. There's always blobs on the order of um, a ha less than half a millimeter or so, and then they repeat at the millimeter scale. So the size of the blob is not related to any pattern in the world. It's related to the cortical surface only. Okay, so this is the putative meaning of an orientation map, that, um, that the representation of the photoreceptor level is like a camera. The representation at the LGN level is like an enhanced special mode on your camera. Representation at the cortical level has become quite abstract in that there's an indication there is verticality over here. There's an indication of verticality over here, indication of horizontality over here. And the further away you get from B1, your specific mapping between this and the retina becomes less and less specific. The particular location of that horizontal line uh, will be not known because that, those neurons will respond to a horizontal line here and here and over quite a range. And these are all what are called simple cells in V1. Simple cells respond to one particular spot. A complex cell actually responds just as well to this contour as to that one as to that one over a very small range. And the further you get from V1, the larger that range becomes. So at this level, we've started to abstract. We've gone away from the input in terms of pixels and gone on as a representation in terms of the orientations, the local orientations in the image, and the amount of locality as further away you get from V1 becomes less and less. So it becomes less and less. First it was about pixels, then it was about edges, now it's about orientations. The further away you go from the input, the more it becomes harder to express. This is very easy to express, it's hard to understand, but it's very clear that this is, these neurons respond to an oriented edge, um, and at some point, you can imagine there are house selective neurons. Uh, there are claims for this anyway. There are Jennifer Aniston selective neurons. There are claims, claims for that. Um, 
and that the argument is that these maps eventually build up uh, representations of this type. Okay. Now we don't have any data from those areas that would be sufficient to build a model really, so you, you can just say that. But Okay, now practicality. This was just the very, this is the simplest biologically relevant model that I can even think of uh, that explains any of the data. Um, if you want, you can find vastly more complicated models. I have another talk where I could show you many boxes and arrows. Uh, in fact, uh, hundreds of boxes and arrows in the same diagram with different subpopulations. Explains lots of data, very hard to understand. Um, what if you wanted to actually simulate things like this? You can do that in any simulator. You can do this model I just showed you. You can do it in any language. It's, it's relatively simple um, to implement. Um, Genesis and Neuron, you've already looked at Neuron, right? What, what have your tutorials had? What simulators have you used so far? P6? Moose. Moose? Okay, Moose is at the same level. Moose is, is, a, is Genesis, Genesis 3 or Genesis 5. Moose, event, there was Genesis, and then it became Genesis 2 and sort of Genesis 3-ish and Moose kind of offshoot and got re-implemented and so on. Uh, UPI used to use Genesis at the time, so Moose is, is, a, is in this category. Um, and they, they focus on neuron level or below, and you can put things together into larger areas, but that's not what they're built around. It doesn't, they don't provide particular support for that. Um, and things are very hard to do in simulators like that. You can get lots of simulators for the SOM model I talked about but it's kind of irrelevant. Um, you can get lots of simulators for neural networks in general. If you just want an idea of neurons or point neurons and they connect to other neurons, there are lots of simulators like that. But a lot of the issues involved here are in, in, the, um, in setting up this mapping between areas and these patterns of connectivity. It's, it's easy to get that wrong and spend a lot of time doing it. Um, so um, it's not really useful to use a simulator like that. Uh, there's the one simulator that I think is useful and people do use it uh, regularly for maps um, is the uh, Nest simulator. Um, I originally, this is something I wrote about a long time ago, it's, it, the actual core of the simulator is uh, uh, controlled by a PostScript-like language, a reverse Polish language, it's very hard to use, but now it's been nicely wrapped in Python so that's not really as true anymore. Um, but it's not, it's not built around maps, so it's missing some of the abstractions that I, that I think are useful. But it certainly can be used for maps, and people do use it for maps. Um, and a lot of people use MATLAB for maps, because MATLAB is great at matrix, matrix times matrix equals matrix. Anything like that, it does really well. Um, but any, a lot of the things you want to do uh, are not that, and that's actually a very small amount of your total code. Most of it is in managing your simulations and collecting and analyzing results. It's, it's more difficult there. And if you really want to be fast, you can write a simulator in C or C++, but don't ever do that. It's just going to take a lot of time. Instead, what you should use is this simulator because I wrote it. Or, well, I paid people to write it. <laughs> I thought of it anyway. Um, and, um, and the idea for this is that it, it starts out at the level that we want to, that we have, where we have data, the optical imaging data. It starts at that level and then it adds everything in from there. So it, basically it provides you abstractions at this uh, scale. It, it, this is a meaningful entity to Topographica. This, a box of neurons like this, once you create it in Neuron or Genesis or Nest, that becomes a whole bunch of neurons. That becomes 100 million neurons or whatever it is or 100 billion connections. Those are just all, that's all you have. You don't have this higher level abstraction about it. But in Topographica, you, you keep this around. You say, you can refer to all of these neurons very easily and manipulate them and all of these neurons and you can connect between these populations arbitrarily, not just at the beginning. In the, in the other simulators, at the beginning when you're doing it, you have these abstractions, but those disappear when you're actually simulating because the, fundamentally those simulators are built around neurons and connections and that's it or compartments and, uh, or even some finer level of detail. So um, if you want to have maps with uh, a whole lot of different populations, a whole lot of different interconnected areas, it's really hard to use simulators like that. So instead we'll use uh, simulators like this one, uh, designed to uh, um, 
uh, which 12,000 people have downloaded. I don't know who they are. They must just be random people in the street because there aren't that many people who do map level simulations in the world. There are only a couple hundred of us, maybe. So I don't know what's going on there. Um, maybe people are using it for their school coursework or something. Um, um, anyway, basically what this will do is let you rapidly connect a whole bunch of, basically you'll make, you can make a model of the brain in 15 minutes if you want to. You just say, oh, I want 40 areas and I want them connected like this. Topographica will do that for you. It's adding detail is hard in Topographica. Whereas in other simulators, detail is easy. Connecting it all into all these big populations is what's hard. So it's a, it's a trade-off. Um, at this level, uh, rapidly connecting a whole bunch of things is very easy. Um, we have a whole lot of parameterized components that you basically, you can make them do whatever you want. They're already written. Um, it's all in Python, so you can control it very easily. And what, what you want to do if you want to have the, this type of, the, the goals of the summer school for bridging across levels, Python is very easy to do interfacing to other simulators. It's amazingly simple. And I'll do a demo of that in the tutorial today. Um, so basically, you can have low-level low stuff in here and you can use Topographica to set up this large-scale environment for it. Have your very detailed model for something, but usually in detailed models, your model for the rest of the brain is null, zero, or almost nothing. This lets you go, it's a horrible model for the rest of the brain, but it's better than zero. So you can have the, the, the amount of, the other information coming in. If you were gonna study a tiny chunk of V1, you can do that at whatever detail level you want, but you can embed it in this model that brings in everything else to whatever level of detail you can handle. So it's, uh, I know this isn't a very strong selling point, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> it's saying Topographica will give you a model of the rest of the brain that is better than nothing, and amazingly, nothing is what almost everyone does. So it's, e it's amazingly easy to do better than nothing. So even though it's a ridiculous model, it's still, literally, it's better than nothing, and it's, and it's and nothing is very typical. So. Uh, anyway, it has model, you can model the world in all sorts of ways, I won't get into that. Basically, there's a whole bunch of libraries for, for generating and composing patterns. All of that is a separate module. Uh, you can download that and use that without whatever simulator you want, if you like this ability to, to generate patterns. Um, uh, you can take data straight from video cameras, um, whatever you want. Modules for all of that. Um, basically, what we do is we have very strong support for things that are boxes and arrows. Doesn't matter what you put in that box, if you simulate that in some other simulator, I don't care. If you can get a matrix of activity, a matrix of floating point numbers, then it'll work. Any sort of box like that that has a matrix of numbers that can be sent here and here, and then topographical will handle in intercommunication between all of these components. It'll do all of that at the high level, and it'll also simulate what's in the boxes as long as what you want in the boxes is simple. If what you want in the boxes is a big complicated mess, it won't do that for you, or it won't help you do that but other simulators will, and so that's fine. So, um, uh, how many people know the difference between a clocked simulator and an event-driven simulator? Nobody? Okay, a clocked simulator, there's a, there's a metronome. You do compute here, nothing. Compute here, nothing. So according, on a timeline, you compute at regularly spaced intervals over time. An event-driven simulator, say if you have a set of spiking neurons, would compute, and only when a neuron spikes would there be an event that is then transmitted to these other neurons, and they don't, you don't compute them at all until they have an incoming event. Once they do, then you compute what would have happened in the times that you weren't computing. So that's called an event-driven simulator versus a clocked. Topographica supports either one. Fundamentally, it's event-driven, but you can create an event that's, that's a clock, and then it works. So uh, you don't have to know much about that, but if you think about your underlying simulation, what, what does matter is when you're connecting across simulation levels. The fact that Topographica doesn't have a clock is good because if your underlying simulator has one clock, and say you want to connect to some other simulator that has a different clock, the fact that Topographica doesn't have a clock means you can do that and it won't care. It'll just handle events as they come in. So that's, that's very useful when you're bridging simulators. And a lot of simulators that have clocks or more difficult to simulate to other simulators with clocks unless you can get those clocks synchronized. So, uh, that's all that was about. I um, already talked about that. Uh, we don't have to talk about that. And as I said, there's basically a library of all sorts of components that it'll give you. Uh, One dimensional patterns, that would be like a random number stream. There's a whole big library of all possible 
all sorts of random number streams or increasing number, whatever types of number streams you might want. A huge library of different two-dimensional patterns. Both of these are usable externally through, for any uh, program. A bunch of what, what we call transfer functions that basically take a set of data in and transfer it in some way. That's useful for activation functions and whatever. A whole bunch of models of what we call sheets and projections. A sheet would be like one of the boxes. Rejection is like a connection from one sheet to another. Um, you'll, you'll do all of these in the tutorial and just when we come back. So. so basically that's it. When we get to the, that's the overview of the simulation tools. When we get to the tutorial itself, we we're talking about one model at that point. This is the model and this is how it's implemented and this is what you're running and so on. So. Um, uh, this is all freely available, of course. You can just download anything. Uh, the book that describes all of it is not freely available, but um, all the figures from the book are freely available. Um, and the, the simple message is you can do, you can do a map model any time, any kind of map model you want. You can do it in map MATLAB. The more complicated it is, it's not going to work. You can do it in Neuron and Genesis. It do, again, they don't help with complicated models. Uh, you can write your own code, but don't do that. Instead, use this. Okay? And you'll use this for your tutorial. I'll also show you how to interface between Topographica and Nest, which is the same for interfacing between Topographica and Neuron. I don't know how to interface between Topographica and Moose, but I assume it's possible in similar ways. Oh. Any final questions? All right, well, hopefully see you at the tutorial. And we'll go from there. <laughs>